Previously on the advent of cyber. The malicious document attached to the phishing email was confirmed to have been executed. Our in-house expert, Forensic McBlue, confirmed that the malicious document spawned another suspicious binary. And as you can see, the information we get back from it now is a lot more informative. Move mystery gift to mystery gift exe. Process name is mystery gift dot exe but we're going to change this to contains but as you can see the amount of data that we get is quite overwhelming so we're going to need to right click some of these and exclude them from the results you'll see that there's only two files that we need to worry about there's only two domain names it's best festival company.thm and virus total.com <laughs> Hello world and welcome to Hacks. We are now on day 13 of the Try Hack Me Advent of Cyber 2022. I believe that's over halfway. Day 13, packet analysis. Simply having a wonderful PCAP time. I have done packet analysis before as part of troubleshooting using Wireshark. It's a very useful skill and a very useful tool to know how to use. I don't think I've done it to the extent that we're going to be covering it in this room, but this is going to be a good learning experience and I can't wait to dive in. The story. After receiving the phishing email on day 6 and investigating malware on day 12, it seemed everything was ready to go back to normal. However, monitoring systems started to show suspicious traffic patterns just before closing the case. Now Santa's SOC team need help in analysing the suspicious network patterns. And the learning objectives of this room are to learn what traffic analysis is and why it still matters, learn the fundamentals of traffic analysis, learn the essential Wireshark features used in case investigation, learn how to assess the pattern and identify anomalies in the network, learn to use additional tools to identify malicious address and conduct further analysis, help the ALF team investigate suspicious traffic patterns. So what is packet analysis? Well to understand packet analysis we need to understand what a packet is. A packet is data essentially so whenever you make a request to a web server if you're getting www.google.com or if you're sending an instant message that request is broken down into very small sections called packets. They're like little envelopes of data which get posted to the various places on the internet and packet analysis is effectively analyzing those packets looking for patterns looking for IP addresses looking for anything suspicious inside them that's just a high level overview of packet analysis there's far much more to it than what I've just said but I want to keep it at a high level overview we could talk about the difference between TCP and UDP packets how they all have different headers with different byte lengths and different structures and how each sort of header is essential for successful communications so when you get a collection of packets, they're usually bundled together in a file called a PCAP, which can be analysed with various different tools, including the one we're going to be using today, which is Wireshark. Wireshark provides a graphical user interface which allows you to load PCAPs or even capture live traffic, and it breaks it down nicely into different protocols, IP addresses, and has a lot of different functionality which you can use to analyse the packet and show different statistics. Let's launch Wireshark. I've just gone up to the spawn machine button in this room, spawned it now we're in the split view we can load Wireshark up wait for that to load and when we, then we can load the PCAP into it and start analyzing the PCAP so you can see Wireshark's loading there and what you'll see when you open Wireshark is your interfaces in order to start a live capture you'll see like Eve zero or your network adapter name and you'll be able to just click on it and you'll see the actual traffic pop up there and you'll be able to start recording live traffic but what we want to do for this exercise is we want to just grab the PCAP that's on the desktop and just drag it in and then you'll see all the data there ready to go. So the first question asks, view the protocol hierarchy menu. What is the percent packets value of the hypertext transfer protocol? So we can do that by going to statistics and going to protocol hierarchy. And then you can see that it's broken down in a hierarchy. So you've got your frame at the top and then you've got ethernet that's next on the stack. Then you've got internet protocol version four that's next on the stack. If you know your OSI model, this will probably be familiar as you work your way down and you're looking at NTP domain name system but then you can see hypertext transfer protocol and the percentage of packets that are http is 0 0.3 
The next question in the room asks us to view the conversations, navigate to the TCP section and answer which port number has received more than 1000 packets. Let's have a look. So we're going to go to statistics again into conversations and then we've got different tabs across the top. If we go to TCP3, you'll see there that we have these IP addresses. I believe that's going to be source and destination and then we have port A and port B. So port A doesn't really matter because that's the origin port that's randomly assigned normally randomly assigned when you make a nightbound connection. But the destination port is what we're looking for and you can see there port 80 has received 277, 10 from these different IP addresses or the same IP addresses, different different destinations. But this destination here, 10.10.29.186, has received 1,125 packets to port 3389. And port 3389, as we know, is Microsoft Remote Desktop Protocol, which is a remote management protocol that allows you to essentially get a desktop in front of you, like a graphical user interface, but you're connecting to a remote machine. But that's the answer. The port that has received more than 1,000 packets is 3389. Nine, but we can now also answer the next question. What is the service name used for the protocol that has received more than a thousand packets? Well, we know that's just going to be RDP for Remote Desktop Protocol. The next question asks us to filter by DNS packets and answer what are the domain names? Enter the domain names in alphabetical order and in a defanged format. So firstly, we need to close this window and go to our filter at the top and just type in DNS. And then that should show all the requests being made. And you can see there, we have a cdn.bandityeti.thm and bestfestivalcompany.thm. We've seen these in the previous tasks and it asks us now to defang these URLs and submit them. Now we know how to defang but we learned this in I believe it was the email analysis section where we use Cyberchef. No it was actually in the room called Cyberchef. So all we're going to do is we're going to come in here we're going to search for defang URL and we're going to drag that into the middle and then we're going to do best festivalcompany.thm and you can see there all it's doing is it's putting the dot in between square brackets and then we're going to come down here paste that there if we can copy that and then we're going to put a comma and then the next one is cdn.bandityeti.thm so it's going to be cdn.bandit yeti.thm and you can see there it's added the square brackets around the first period or the first full stop as well so you can copy that paste that into the answer to click submit and hopefully that will give us the correct answer ah i spelled cdn wrong cnd cdn let's hope for no other spelling mistakes fantastic also for those that don't know cdn is probably short for content delivery network in this case and a content delivery network is essentially that it's a network if you think of a cdn you can think of things like cloudflare where they offer services like web application firewalls ddos protection everything gets routed through their content delivery network before it reaches the destination so if you have a website hosted on a server you can route all your dns through cloudflare's cdn so it might masks the true IP address of your host and then the DNS is handled internally by Cloudflare. So whenever someone makes a request, it goes to the Cloudflare servers first. They check internally where the actual host is, and then the traffic gets routed through their content delivery network to the actual destination, allowing them to protect you in the event of denial of service attacks or distributed denial of service attacks. Anyway, moving on to the next question. It now wants us to filter by HTTP packets and answer what are the names of the requested files? Enter the names in alphabetical order and in a defanged format we can do what we just did with dns but instead of dns we're going to put http hit return and then you can see that the files being requested if we scroll over and on the right scroll bar are mysterygift.exe and favicon.ico so we can come into here let's do favicon.ico first so we're going to do favicon.ico and then mysterygift.exe grab that one because that's the first in alphabetical order put a comma Grab mystery gift. I realise I didn't need to put this into Cyberchef, but I'm just using it for the sake of the video. And that answer is correct. The next question asks, which IP address downloaded the executable file? Enter your answer in a defanged format. So we're going to be looking at mysterygift.exe. We're going to scroll across to the source and it's going to be 10.10.29.186. Let's try and remember that. 10.10.29.186. We're going to grab that. Why is it not defanged it? We want to defang IP address, don't we? There we go. Boosh. And we can grab that. You can see it's just put the full stops in between square brackets and we can pop that out 
answer into there and click submit. And the follow-up question to that is, what domain hosts the malicious file? Enter your answer in a defanged format. So we're talking about the mysterygift.exe, but as you can see, there's nothing to be seen on this line here. So what we have to do is we have to actually come down into the packet. And you can see you've got all these different expandable fields. All we're gonna do is go straight to hypertext transfer protocol and you can see it's the cdn.bandityeti.thm. Then we're gonna grab that, send it back over to here and pop it in and get the correct answer. The next question asks, what is the user agent value used to download the non-executable file? So we're gonna be looking at the favicon.ico and we can do the same. We go into the HTTP and you can scroll down to the user agent and you can see it's nim HTTP client. Can we just copy that out? Copper value. I'm just gonna paste this into here, fantastic. And then hopefully we can just throw it into there, click submit, and we get the correct answer. But what is a user agent? Well, anytime you make a request to a website, one of the headers included in the request is the user agent, and it allows you to uniquely identify your browser to the end resource. However, user agents can also be used for nefarious ways. Well, not nefarious. If you've got websites that have paywalls in place, I believe Forbes is one of them, you can actually switch your user agent to that of a Google indexing bot in order to view that content because they want that content to be indexed on the web so that it's easily findable findable find so that you can easily find it through Google they don't want that content blocked when the index robots or crawlers come to view it so if you get a user agent switcher in your browser and then you switch it to a Google bot chances are you might be able to bypass that paywall and read the article that you wanted to read there are other types of attacks that you can do in it as well you can set the user agent to different values and I believe log for shell and log for J because the user agent will be being logged into a file you get remote code execution for the user agent but yeah that's a whole separate video and I just thought I'd add it in the next question asks us to export objects from the PCAP file and calculate the file hashes. What is the SHA-256 hash value of the executable file? So in order to do that, we're just going to go to file, export objects, HTTP, and then we're going to keep both of those. And we're going to click save all, and then we're going to go to our desktop. We're going to create a new file called export, and we're going to open that and click save. And then we can jump into our terminal, and then we're going to CD to desktop, and then into exports. Then we're going to do SHA-256, and it was sum on mysterygift.exe, and that should give us the SHA-256 sum of the file in question. And if we just paste that onto our clipboard, grab that, paste that into the answers, and we should have the correct answer. And the final question asks us to search the hash value of the executable file on VirusTotal. Navigate to the behavior section. There are multiple IP addresses associated with this file. What are the connected IP addresses? Enter the IP addresses defanged in numerical order. Really? <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit pedantic, try at me if I'm being honest. You want them in numerical order, do you? Okay, thanks. In numerical order, okay. Oh, jeez. Right, so we're going to grab the hash again from here. Then we're going to head over to virus total, go into search, paste the hash, and then in the behavioral section, it does say behavioral section, doesn't it? Yeah, behavioral section. There are some IP addresses, allegedly. Here we go. Okay. Right, so I'm just going to grab these take it doesn't want the ports on them either what are the ip addresses defanged in numerical order 443 tcp 443 tcp udp we're defanging those ip addresses so in numerical order do they want google's in there as well i'll keep it in there right so we're gonna put that one at top i don't have much faith in this being correct <laughs> Ah, oh, this is gonna. This this isn't even a fun question. This is an annoying question. So how many have we got? We got one IP address, two IP addresses, three IP addresses. So let's get rid of the Google address. Okay. In the grand scheme of things, if this works, it wasn't that bad. Submit. Yeah, that was correct. But yeah, that's still really annoying. I suppose they have to put it in numerical format because if the data bank answer doesn't match up to what you're submitting in, then you're never gonna get the right answer. So I kind of understand that. I just wish it was a bit more flexible on their end so you could just put them in in any order and it would recognize them maybe they could have like a list of answers that would be the correct answers i don't know i'm just very picky but that is it that is packet analysis now i may not have answered it the way 
the video that's uh, the the person in the video has answered it great tutorial it talks about following tcp streams and things like that i found it other ways and i would recommend exploring wireshark fully checking out all of its functionalities it's a great tool it's a great resource to help with identifying why certain things aren't working or to identify you know certain things happening on the network especially if you want to look for like cisco traffic like cdp stp and things like that can help identify those this room was a lot more relaxed than the previous few rooms we've gone through probably because i have a bit more experience with wireshark than the last software that we used which i had no clue about but i enjoyed this one except this last question because anyway that's all i've got for you today i hope you enjoyed it if you did give me a thumbs up and subscribe and i'll see you next time kind regards